Hey everyone, I'm Hunter Molson with another episode of the Breaking Boundaries podcast by Barbell Apparel. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Daniel Carlson. He's an American football NFL place kicker. Uh, he plays for the Las Vegas Raiders here in Barbell Apparel's hometown of Vegas. He's one of the top three kickers in the league currently. And uh, we're excited to kind of like dive in, get a little bit about his athletic background, how he came to play in the NFL, um, what makes him tick as a competitor, how he trains, uh, how he juggles being a professional athlete with his family life, and more. Uh, Daniel, great to have you here today, and we're excited to talk. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, always like the opportunity to chat with like-minded people, um, you know, who, who get the competitive aspect, especially once it's the off season. I don't get to have that quite as much besides maybe playing some golf or something uh, with buddies. But, um, you know, I love just talking about this kind of stuff. So honored to be here today. Yeah, no, I, we're, we're lucky to have you. And um, we've been working with you for a while. I, I mm -hmm. can't remember how um, one of my team members, Kyle, originally got in contact with you. But I think the like in our original Kickstarter for the jeans, they kind of like birthed the company by accident. A lot of people probably don't know that story that may be listening, but that is how Barbell Apparel came about. We had mm -hmm. this idea for something called Athletic Fit Jeans, which didn't exist at the time. Uh, we launched a Kickstarter for it. It kind of went viral and we decided to make a full-time business out of it. But um, in that original Kickstarter video, we had a friend of ours like basically kicking a football in the jeans. He was a kicker for UNLV. And I think it was like a really compelling image because like as a place kicker, you guys have like this crazy flexibility in your mm -hmm. leg and the jeans didn't kind of like bind it up at all. So he was able to do a full, you know, field goal kick or punt or whatever mm -hmm. in the jeans kind of without skipping a beat. And so uh, when we started working with you, I kind of immediately connected the dots and were like, hey, this is probably a guy who's uh, actually capable of getting the most <laughs> performance our jeans are capable of providing. Yeah. No, we and then we we actually went out one day and shot. I think it was what two two years ago now. Um, shot some videos and tested out the jeans and you know had a good time with that. Uh, just messing around on the field and sure enough, they worked. I think it was. I only kicked like five balls on the day. It was still I think in season, so I probably shouldn't have been honestly kicking off site, but it is what it is. Um, but we had a good time and you know I think I was a hundred percent on the day. So the, the jeans work, everybody. <laughs> Hey, yeah. Good luck charm, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So you mentioned that you probably shouldn't have been kicking offside because it was in season. I suppose like, is that, is, is kicking that intense uh, uh, like physically? Not, not compared to the rest of football, not compared to, you know, but, but it is, I guess the best comparison I would have is like a pitcher in baseball. Um, you know, physically one throw might not be that intense. I mean, you are, you're moving pretty fast. You're moving pretty aggressively, but like a guy's not going to get hurt off of one throw typically, but you know, like every pitcher in baseball has, they have a certain pitch count where, Hey, if you start get to a hundred throws in a game, the coach has to start pulling the guy back because it's like, all right, how, you know, how many more can he go? Now he's a little fatigued. Can his arm get hurt here? Um, I think that's the best comparison with kicking because you know, like pitchers, we can't kick every day. We have to have off days in between practices or games or whatever it may be. Um, you always have to be a little conscious of, hey, where, how many have I kicked today? Where do my legs feel like today? Um, and so it's it's that balance between, you know, I want to get as much work as I can and push myself as much as I can. But at the same time, I have to be smart to know that, hey, if I, you know, tweak something today or if I'm too sore from today's work, I won't be able to get as quality work tomorrow or um, the next day. And so there's that balance between, yeah, like you, you want to grind it out as much as you can, but you have to be smart doing it as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I suppose like, right, to develop that ability to kick a football like you do, like you, I, presumably you've been doing that, you know, the majority of your life. Yeah. But um, developing that that level of like obviously the athletic ability the power and everything but also like an extreme degree of flexibility um was the flexibility something that just developed over time as you did it growing up and is it mm -hmm. something that you have to like consciously warm up before you start kicking or can you just kind of like fling your leg around like that yeah on hand? well as i've i mean i'm only 28 years old now so i'm, st I'm still young um but 
as I've gotten older, it's it's been my warm up routine, my stretch routine, my you know I roll out, I stretch with the band, I do you know a kind of kinetic workout where I'm moving around a good bit. Um, that's gotten longer and longer because one, I'm doing it at a higher level now where I have the time, I have the resources, I know I need to take care of my body in order to perform well and hopefully play this game for a long time. And so when I, you know, first started kicking in high school, when I was 14, 15 years old, I could just roll out of bed and kick and kick and kick and kick and I'd be fine. But nowadays, you know, it's a little different. It's like I said, it's a little more about the quality of my work day, not the quantity um, a lot of times. So being smart with my warm ups and, and after working on the stretching, because I mean, I, I've never been a naturally flexible person. I mean, I remember you remember those like presidential fitness tests when you were like a kid and yep, stuff. Definitely. So like the one where you have to reach and try and like touch your toes. That's against the one the, that would the always get me. Yeah, they, they, it yeah. would always get me and everything else. I was, you know, ultra competitive as a kid and it would drive me crazy. So I remember like working that as a kid um, and then I, I grew up a soccer player. And so like that was always something I, I had to work on. I was just a stiff kid growing up, you know, tall, tall, lanky kid. Um, but as I've gotten, you know, more and more into kicking, I, I realized like what a big part of that was for this sport. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. And you you've talked a lot about kind of like how, as you've gotten older, you have to spend more time warming up. And I think that most people who have been doing athletics since they were a younger mm -hmm. adolescent into their adulthood would echo the same sentiment. And I kind of wonder, right? Like if you were to compare your ability to kick a football now to your ability to kick a football when you were a teenager, like I guess that you could kick a football substantially harder and further and m more deeply at as, as a 28 year old, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely think there's a certain amount of that. I do also think that like, I mean, I mean, a male's athletic prime usually they say is like 27-ish years old. Obviously, it depends on like what sport you're doing. Kickers, a lot of it's experience. So a lot of, yeah. you know, that's why you can have kickers that go into their late 40s sometimes. Um, but I would say like I probably peaked physically in college. I was lifting more. I was running more. I was, you know, the best athlete I'd been. Um, but as far as like the fine-tuned mechanics of kicking – I'm better now than I ever was. And so because of my technique, I think I can kick it further, kick it obviously much more accurately, which is the main, main thing in my job um, than I could. But yeah, I think, you know, even at like 18 years old, I could boom kickoffs almost as good as I can now, but it, the consistency wasn't there. And that's, that's gotcha. the big thing that I think has improved through the quality of reps and just the experience that comes along with that. Yeah. Cause uh, like, obviously as, as you know, an athlete ages, um, and like, obviously you're still well within your prime, but people do talk about like, Hey, it takes longer to warm up to prevent injury, things like mm -hmm. that. You have to be more mindful of recovery. And obviously some of that's just like physiological limitations. Yeah. But part of me also wonders too, is that as you develop more mastery in, in a given sport, right. It's like, you're, you know, I'm sure when you go to like rip a field goal or, or practice your kicks now, like you, it's so heavily ingrained in your nervous system and the muscle memory mm -hmm. and, and everything's just so dialed in that it's like, you can, you could tell your body to do it on command. Whereas, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you know, you weren't like, you weren't quite as accurate. Yeah. And so it's like now, like kind of no matter what, right? Like say you took t time off from kicking entirely, like, if you step back onto a field and kick to football, like your brain's going to remember how to do that. And I yeah. often like have this conversation with other people where it's like, Oh, you know, I feel like, you know, I spend all this time warming up now and it's kind of like, well, I think part of it is just the, uh, how things go as you, you know, aren't a teenager anymore or whatever. But I also think that like you spend all this time acquiring talent and muscle memory and mm -hmm. the skill component and your brain remembers that stuff. Even yeah. if like you haven't been training it all the time, and like you could force yourself to kind of like just do it on demand. But mm -hmm. if you have, if you haven't been there from a training perspective, 100%. it's yeah. a really easy way to just kind of like hurt yourself. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, like, especially talked about like the warm up, like having a routine that allows you to fall back into that muscle memory 
and that peak performance over and over again. I think that's something that, you know, comes with age and maturity is realizing like I could, you know, I could probably roll out of bed, get a quick stretch and kick just fine for the most part. But, you know, whether my hamstrings are tight, something's, you know, just a little off, you know, that little minuscule, you know, difference between my normal game day, you know, feeling really loose, feeling really good, that muscle memory feeling, um, you know, that's a big difference, especially as you get to a higher level. Um, I mean, the difference between an NFL kicker and a college kicker is pretty minuscule, really. Yeah. But, you know, it's those little differences day in and day out that make a big difference. And so, yeah, just making sure, you know, as I continue to get older, very strict about kind of my warm up routines, my routines at practice, so that I can kind of have a controlled um, quality work day, whether it's 50 kicks, whether it's 20 kicks, um, whatever it is, I'm taking advantage of each one of those and, you know, tweaking that muscle memory to exactly where I need it for game day later on. Yeah, no, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I, th I think that, um, every athlete, like obviously you're competing at like, you know, world-class professional level, but I think that any, anyone that takes their athletic, like at least nominally seriously would be smart to establish something similar, like a routine they can go mm -hmm. through to, to, to get, get them back in that place of performance. Also to like assess readiness, like maybe yeah. a certain muscle is not feeling right or it needs to be stretched more, needs to be warmed up more. Um, that way when it's time to perform, you're kind of ready to get, ready to rumble. And I think that, uh, the interesting thing about, like a, a an athletic role like kicking is that it's kind of like so highly specialized that you're able to distill a lot um maybe more like innumerable factors like things you could talk about and say yeah. like this is what i do because you're doing this very one highly specialized specific, specific yeah. thing 100%. and like you mentioned that oh maybe you were more all-around athletic um, during college when you were doing maybe like more all encompassing training. Exactly. And now it's like you get paid to kick a football in the NFL and that's what you have to do, right? Yeah. Like you need yeah. to make those field goals. The ball needs to go where you want it to mm -hmm. go. And so it's totally fine to maybe sacrifice other domains of athleticism to be very good at that one thing. 100%. And I would argue that if we're looking at like kind of the raw definition of athleticism, being like so good at the one thing is like, a very good definition of an athlete, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, I think that's cool. But, but I, I think it's an interesting way to look at a at, at athletic ability when you're able to kind of like distill it down to the very essence of like what makes this very specialized thing fire. Um, and so, no, it'll be fun to talk more about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I suppose you mentioned coming up that as a child you were a soccer player. At what point did you gravitate gravitate towards football? Yeah. So it wasn't um, until basically the summer before high school um, that I was at church one day and the special teams coordinator for the high school I was at, uh, he came up to us. Uh, he was a family friend and he's like, Hey, we don't have a kicker um, for the football team this year. I know, you know, you play soccer. Would you be interesting, interested in, you know, trying out? And obviously I was like, you know, that'd be fun. I have friends on the football team. Um, and we we're like, I mean, what is it, what does it entail? Cause obviously I was a very competitive soccer player. That was, kind of my, you know, goal, play professional soccer, play college soccer, all that good stuff. Um, and basically it was like, all right, you show up on game day if, you know, if you're good at this and when, you know, that's all we need, you just show up on game day. It was a two-way high school in Colorado. So like it wasn't, it wasn't very serious football um, compared to, you know, some big 5A, big, big uh, Texas high school or something like that. Um, but we basically had an informal tryout that day right after church um, and I like made a couple PATs on a high school field and they're like, all right, that's good enough for us. We'll see if, you know, Friday at the first game. Um, and it kind of developed from there cause I was playing soccer and then literally I just show up on Fridays. Um, and then about two years later going into my junior year, I was like, okay, I actually like really am starting to enjoy this. You know, I worked on it a little more on just really the off season, um, when I wasn't playing as much soccer. Um, to just, you know, see what I could do and started realizing I was a lot, you know, better than I, than I thought. Um, and so once I really started putting that work in, um, pretty quickly I had a good junior year 
And then going into my senior year, went to a kicking camp and, uh, you know, had no, I, I knew I was good for small town Colorado, uh, but I didn't know how good I was. And then went to a kicking camp and got ranked number one nationally, uh, just, you know, had no idea about it. And so the next day I'm on the phone with college coaches and, you know, we're talking about going to Notre Dame, Ohio State, uh, uh, Auburn, uh, LSU, you know, all these different schools. And so all of a sudden my life changed on a dime almost. Um, where I'm having to decide like, okay, I know I've been, you know, really starting to gravitate towards football, but, you know, I wasn't quite ready to let go of soccer yet, you know, cause I was still talking to some small schools in soccer. So, but, you know, once you, once you start talking to these giant SEC school, uh, you know, schools in football and you're talking to like a D2 school in soccer, um, you know, it, it starts making you f- think about it a little, a little harder about, you know, Hey, I love soccer, but what a great opportunity I might have in this, this department as well. Yeah. That's a crazy story. And, and so, I mean, I, I didn't actually know that coming into this conversation, but your trajectory into football was pretty fast. Like yeah. you, you oh, yeah. came from basically, um, had you never really played football on a comp- like maybe as a no. kid you played for fun, but you didn't play as a, in a competitive level before that, huh? Mm-mm. Yeah, and then some backyard football with my brothers and friends. You know, played at recess, but I'd never, you know, I still to this day I have one rush in football. I've touched the ball with my hands besides kicking or punting. Uh, I did punt a little in college, but uh, you know, I've I've never done anything besides kick on a football field. Yeah, that's, I mean, and obviously I'm sure the background in soccer helped, right? Because mm-hmm. you have a, yeah. had the, a lot of athleticism from that. Um, but I suppose, like, I guess in your own perception, how much of the, your ability to just gravitate towards that was just like, I guess, where do you think that that natural applicability came from? Is it so like, w- w- did your family do stuff like this? Do you think yeah. it's genetic? Or is it just something that clicked with you? I mean, I, we always have this argument with football guys is, you know, like how much of it is talent, how much of it is just like, you know, your environment, your product of your environment, you grew up playing sports. Um, and I think, you know, that's the main thing is my dad was a college uh, tennis player, played professionally a little bit. My mom was a really good high school athlete. Um, and then, you know, my older brother played college and professional soccer. Uh, little brother, he is, he just finished college football at Auburn. Uh, he's going to be in the NFL combine here soon. And hopefully, you know, hopefully he can make it to the next level um, in the NFL. But, you know, we, we grew up playing all sorts of sports. Um, but, you know, I think really for me, it wasn't, I wasn't just naturally talented. It was my older brother was a soccer goalie. And so I spent thousands and thousands of hours, thousands of thousands sh- soccer shots were, you know, shooting against him, competing against him and same with my little brother. And I think that, you know, in turn helped us, you know, veer into kicking where it's very similar technique, very similar muscles, you know, very similar muscle memory, um, you know, just some, some minor differences. And so it was just a very easy transition for both of us um, where I think, you know, all that hard work playing soccer and especially shooting against my brother, you know, turn into, Hey, we can use this for football. And, you know, now you just got to fine tune it basically. Yeah, no, I mean, so you were getting your reps in, right? It was just exactly. a different kind of ball. A different way. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, and so, I mean, and then obviously you started kicking the football, you realized you were good at it. And I guess like if you hadn't gone to that, uh, <clears throat> you called it like a kick camp, kicker camp. Yeah. Kicking camp. Yeah. Kicking camp. Um, your life may have taken a completely different trajectory, huh? Yeah. Because like 100%. no one would, you would have never known that you were like, hey, yeah. you know, one of the best uh, high school kickers in the country at that stage. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember showing up and like I said, like I had, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Uh, I knew I was going to kicking camp to kind of find out a little bo- bit more about like, you know, how good I was nationally. Because yeah, it, I was in a two-way Colorado school where, yeah, like I, I was, I think I was all state, like my sophomore year or something, but like, once again, it's two way football in Colorado. Like it's not, not many kids are getting recruited out of there, unfortunately, or anything like that. And so you had no, I had no idea where I stacked up. And so I'm competing all of a sudden against guys. Oh, that kid has an offer from Oregon. Oh, that kid, you know, and you're like, oh man, these kids must be, 
really, really good. And then all of a sudden I realized like, Hey, I can kind of hang with these kids. Um, and you know, we had some competition, some charting. And, um, I remember the head guy, it was called Cole's kicking camp, but he's still, he's still the biggest kind of like college recruiting, uh, coach. And he actually, he actually works for the Carolina Panthers now as a consultant for their kickers. But, um, you know, he just knows his stuff. And after one day he kind of pulled me aside and he's like, who are you, where you come from? And like, you know, what are your plans? And I was like, I mean, I'm just, I'm just here for the ride. Like I'm, I'm, I'm figuring it out. He's like, you know, your life's about to change. Like he, he literally told me, he's like, we're going to be on this phone tomorrow with whatever schools you want to go to. And like, we, we're about to change your life. And it, it was just really cool. Just like, you know, how quickly he was able to see that talent that was there at that point. And like, you know, he was willing to be like, Hey, you know, like, I don't know you very well, but I want to get to know you because I want to go on this journey to help you, you know, go to college and hopefully pursue your dreams in football uh, in the future. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And so um, you ended up playing in college and as you're playing in college, was the NFL the goal? Did you, I mean, this happened so quickly. Was your thinking along those lines? I mean, I I think the first couple of years, it was just like, I just want to, you know, I want to start, I want to play, I want to do well. Um, And then, so my first year I redshirted and I knew I was going to redshirt. And so that was kind of like, Hey, the first year is just, you know, get a feel for it. We actually went to the national championship that year. um, And it was just an awesome experience to kind of be in that environment at the highest level, well, college highest level. Um, and, you know, get to experience that and then know next year, okay, now it's like my time to do it. And so, yeah, early on, it's just like, I just want to do well for the team. I want to do well, uh, personally, but like, I wasn't thinking too much ahead and then kind of same thing where that second year playing, I realized like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty good. I got nominated for the kicker of the year award, stuff like that. And I realized like, oh, maybe, maybe this journey can continue if I continue to put in the work, continue to do what I'm doing. Um, you know, maybe there is a future in this as well outside of just college. So um, I think, yeah, sophomore, junior year, kind of similar with high school football. Like that's when I started realizing like, hey, maybe this next levels a, can be a goal. Um, but when I showed up, you know, I was just trying to have fun, have, you know, compete and do the best I could for the team. And then, you know, you can tack on those personal aspirations as well as you, as you go, I think. Yeah. And um, obviously your, your college career culminated in you being drafted um, for the Vikings. So, I mean, obviously that had to be just a, an incredible feeling, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that I was the first kicker taken in that draft in 2018. Um and, you know, obviously, I, I think we're going to get into it more later, but, uh, you know, you're right in the highest of highs. You know, I, I thought it was just so awesome to be drafted. You know, I had finished with a great college career. Uh, I just got married. And so we're headed to Minnesota to, you know, somewhere I'd never been before uh, to play football, you know, at the highest level. And what, a, what an awesome experience. And then, um, you know, like, like I said, we, we'll talk about this next, but, you uh, you know, week two of the season, I, I get cut. And so then all of a sudden you're like, you know, now what, uh, you know, because yeah, I'd won the job in camp against a vet kicker that was really solid. Um, and then, yeah, t- week two, we played at green Bay. I missed three kicks and all of a sudden I'm out of a job and, you know, you're trying to figure out like, all right, I made it to the NFL, but now I've been fired from the NFL in two weeks. And you know, what, what's next? Um, and you know, it was a great looking back, it was a great thing for me because I learned a lot about myself and a lot about, you know, how, how I handled adversity, um, and, you know, just kind of solidified in my own mind, Hey, I deserve to be in this league and, you know, I'm going to continue to work and, you know, find my spot. And, you know, that was four years ago now, five years ago now. Um, and it's, it's been an awesome ride since then where, you know, I've continued to, you know, try and become the best kicker I can. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure most people know, but spoiler alert, he ended up being, (laughs) you know, one of the top three kickers in the league. So it all worked out great, but yeah, let's dive in a little bit into the dynamic there because right. Mm -hmm. You got drafted into the NFL. Um, you beat out a vet kicker 
And then in week two, you miss three kicks and you're cut. So yeah. let's let's talk about missing the three kicks to start. Um, Cause I, I am interested kind of like in the, the, the performance under pressure dynamics, yeah. right? Like yeah. you come 100%. from soccer into high school, you're just doing it for fun. You're in college, you're, you know, you're just want to do the best you can. You have a great college career and now you're in the NFL. And now it's kind of like, there's really nowhere else to go from here. You're in the NFL. Yeah. And now it's like, you got to perform. So I suppose like what was the experience like coming from a place where kind of like the stakes were significantly lower to a place where basically the stakes couldn't be any higher? Yeah. And I, I think at the time, you know, it, it does feel more like a business, right? When you get it, you know, there's, there's money involved. Uh, there's agents involved. There's all these, you know, outside things other than just like, you're just there with your friends playing football you know, like it is in high school and somewhat of what it feels like in college. But whereas the NFL, there's just like, you know, contract negotiations. It's more of an individual sport at times because all these guys have like their own personal aspirations. It's not just like, it's not a true team. True teams are switching year in and year out. Uh, I mean, game to game, you know, new guys are coming in, guys are getting cut. Um, and so you can definitely feel that as a rookie where like, you know, you show up with your rookie class and by the time camp's done, over half of them are gone. Um, I mean, really over half of the people at camp are gone. You, you show up to camp with usually like a 90-ish man roster. And back then it was, you cut down to a 53 man active roster. And so almost half the guys are, you know, cut on the streets trying to figure out kind of what's next for them. Um, so, you know, I just overcome that after being drafted and, you know, then, Played my first game, did well, made one one kick, um, and then we uh, go to Green Bay. And I don't I don't know if it was necessarily like feeling the difference in environment between this business type environment in the NFL where you're at like this very performance based league or what. But I you know because I do think I was really ignorant to a lot of that being a rookie, just like any other rookie in sports is a lot of times. Um, but yeah, just in the moment where like after those three kicks and after a terrible game, I mean, obviously personally, I felt terrible about my performance, but I didn't at all think I was going to get cut. You know, I was kind of blindsided by that um, because I just didn't quite understand, you know, how demanding uh, that league can be at times. And so um, it would, helped me grow up and, you know, mature in this business a lot. Uh, but nef that wasn't necessarily fun at the time. But like I said, I, I think I learned from it and was able to, you know, turn that into a lot of good going forward. Yeah. And I mean, obviously you took the adversity like a champ and turned it into uh, a, what has been an amazing career. Um, but I guess like, so after you were cut from the Vikings, what did you, how did that impact you? What was kind of like the decision-making process and how did you end up playing for the Raiders? Yeah. So, um, like I said, for a few weeks there was basically my wife and I, we were in Minnesota trying to figure out what's next. Like I said, I, you know, for me as a, what was I, 22 year old, 20, yeah, 22 year old, you know, it was like, what, you know, do, am I going to have another chance at the NFL? I don't, you know, I don't really know how that works. A lot of, like I said, a lot of it was just ignorance. I didn't really know, um, being new to that being a so ex soccer player kind of drifting into it. Like I didn't know the ins and outs of how that was going to work out. So, um, you know, with my agent, we figured out like, okay, we're going to work out with a couple teams. Um, really the first thing I did was went back to that, that, uh, high school kicking coach that kind of gave me a shot into college, uh, and worked with him for a couple weeks, stayed at his house, uh, with his family. And, you know, we just kind of, took a step back and we're like, all right, what, what do we need to technically fix so that, you know, we can go forward and, you know, hopefully get another shot at this league. And next time we do get a shot, you know, technically I'll be a little more sound. Um, and mentally, you know, I can be a little more confident in that. And so, um, we did that for a couple of weeks and then, you know, I was on the road just trying out getting looks with different teams. Um, a lot of times it's with teams that already had a kicker and they're just, you know, getting a backup ready for, um, you know, in case their kicker gets hurt. Cause you only have, you know, with the roster spots, you only have one kicker on the roster. So if you're a backup, you're, you're at home, you're, you're not, you know, you don't have a job with that. And so 
Um, you know, teams are trying to get figure out, hey, if we need an emergency kicker for whatever, you know, someone gets hurt, someone starts doing bad, whatever it may be, like we got to have a list ready. And so I worked out with a couple of teams and then uh, the Raiders had an injury. And so that's how I actually ended up working out with them. Um, and, you know, just impressed the coaches enough. And, you know, a lot of it was, hey, you know, do you feel like you're able to bounce back from that one bad game? Like, where are you at mentally? Um, you know, and I, I I couldn't tell you what I said. You know, I, I think, you know, I probably just told him, hey, it was a learning experience. But, you know, I still think I'm a good kicker and, you know, I'm ready to compete again and prove that to you and prove that to the league. Um, and so, you know, luckily I ended up signing week seven, I think, with them and ended up having a great rest of the rookie year with them. I missed one kick the rest of the season. And, um, you know, it, it was an awesome, awesome experience to come into a new coaching staff. Um, Rich Bisaccia was a special teams coach who ended up being our interim head coach last year um, and led us to playoffs. And, you know, just an awesome, awesome guy that took me under his wing and I think gave me a lot of wisdom and mentorship kind of to help me along that the end of my rookie year, um, which which helped me in the future a lot. Yeah, I mean, what a awesome story! I and like I think there's a couple of cool things there, right? Like I know from the outside looking in um, it, on, on any sort of like impressive achievement, athletics, you know, business, um, anything like that, um, people can tend to perceive a lot of luck in the equation. Mm -hmm. But anytime I really dive into someone's story, you tend to see, I mean, A, you dealt with plenty of adversity and maybe even bad luck, right? Like mm -hmm. having a bad game and then getting cut, not so lucky, right? Mm -hmm. But then coming off the back of that and deciding that like, hey, I'm just going to do what I can control, go work out with these teams, see what happens. You put yourself in the position where, hey, like the Raiders have an injury and now you have the opportunity to show them what you're made of and have another chance. Yeah. And so like by being persistent, by doing the work, you put yourself in the way of the opportunities that arise and in a sense are manufacturing your own luck, which is, is yeah. pretty cool. Um, but I guess the what would be interesting to ask is you had that one kind of like bad game with the Vikings and your career has been amazing since then. Obviously, you mentioned you worked with that um, kicking coach, stayed with his family, worked on some fundamentals. But was there anything else you think from like a mindset perspective that you've done to help you be able to perform well under pressure? Um, or is it just kind of like, you know, muscle memory repetition? You've been there before. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like I said, I, I kind of knew after that there was a maturity level that I had to kind of get to where, you know, I could, you know, now I know like, Hey, it's a performance-based league. Like you can't, you could can be, have one bad game and you're gone all of a sudden. So like knowing that now, like I got to make sure I bring my A game every single day and just, you know, figuring out how to do that. Um, I think everybody's different. Everybody's preparation, everybody's, you know, like day in day out work has to look different to hopefully get them to their A level every day. And so, um, I think the next, you know, even now I'm, I'm still learning, Hey, what do I need to do to set myself up to succeed? And, you know, we talked a little bit about the muscle memory already, but, you know, figuring out my routine for practice, for games, uh, whether it be the warm up, whether it be the kicking work itself, whether, you know, on game day, what does my sideline routine look like? So that when I go in for, you know, I go in for maybe 10 plays a game or so, like I need every one of those to be as perfect as I can. Like how, how do, what can I control to, you know, give myself the best opportunity to succeed each time I'm out there. Um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of the fun quest we're on because it's a, it's a physical thing, obviously that's, that's part of it, but just as much mental for a, a kicker um, or, you know, there's, there's tons of other sports that, really every sport is mental, but there's tons of other, you know, small skills where it's more mental, almost shooting a free throw. Um, you know, there, there's tons of pitching, um, you know, there, there's just tons of sports that, you know, you're kind of at a quieter controlled environment where all of a sudden you can let those thoughts, uh, you know, kind of get out of control. And, you know, that's where uh, you see guys like uh, they cracked under pressure, whatever it may be. 
Um, I don't think it's necessarily, there's necessarily a secret to it. I think it's just learning about yourself. How do I control my mind on the good things and, you know, you know, stay on task, stay locked in where you're not letting your mind flow to those negative thoughts that are, you know, naturally going to pop up if you're just, you know, relaxing and they're like, okay, nine out of 10 times, maybe I can relax and, you know, the crowd doesn't bother me. Maybe this or the wind or the bad weather doesn't bother me. But one of those times, if I have one of those thoughts pop up, you know, then all of a sudden I'm not focused on the right things and I can't succeed as well. So uh, just learning little things about myself to help me lock in, stay focused on the right things, uh, you know, has, has really changed my career, I think. And that's, yeah, that's just come from time, repetitions, maturity, um, and, and a lot of experience. Yeah. No, I mean, that's great advice. Um, focusing kind of like on what you can control. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, 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 we joke about this, like in the office or whatever. It's like, there's a lot of positions in football where, like if you screw up, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the end of the world, right? Like there's there's other factors yeah. at play that can impact your ability to catch the ball or throw the ball or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's like as a as a place kicker, like there's no one else really, right? There's like yeah, yeah. there's like it's the a, weather, I guess, yeah. but it's just on you. And so like yeah. in many ways, I, I feel like there is this immense um, contrast in like if you make a mistake. And oftentimes, like a field goal, that could be the game, right? Yeah. So it's like yeah. there's all this pressure on you. It's like. Um, I don't, I don't think that it's a job that a lot of people would really excel at or, or enjoy just because of the immense amount of, uh, kind of like pressure that Mm -hmm. comes down. And you mentioned that the, you know, the NFL is performance driven league for sure. And in many regards, because there's so few football games in a season Mm -hmm. and, and many, and a lot of those games results can come down to a field goal. It it kind of makes sense, right? That it's like, Hey, if you aren't going to make the goals, then, as the oh, management yeah. staff or coaching team, like we got to make a decision because it could, could cost us our season or a record or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, obviously you've risen above that and you, you perform phenomenally. So I'm curious when you're, when the time comes and you're going to kick in a game, do you perceive that much, much differently than when you go to kick in practice? And uh, what are you, what are you focusing on when the time comes and you have to kick? Are you focusing yeah. on like the movement itself or is there something else that you kind of like, uses your cues to make sure that you perform how you expect. I mean, that's a great question. Um, So, you know, I could, I could go really in depth about this because it's, yeah, kind of, that's the goal because we're, you know, practice kicks matter obviously um, because they're going to, they're going to help success in the game kicks, but it's, it's figuring out, Hey, what's, what do I need to do in those game kicks? What routine do I need to have? Um, And basically what I've done is, you know, there, there's a thing called keywords. And so it's like, you know, they're little triggers. If you're lining up for a free throw and you, you know, you're just like, okay, flick the wrist, whatever it may be. Just one, one thing to get your mind to really lock in and focus on that. And so what I do with my kicking is right before when I jog out on the field, I don't really think about anything. I'm just enjoying, you know, enjoying the crowd, whatever, not really thinking about much. And then once I get to the spot where the holder is going to put the ball. Um, and right before I take my steps back, that's when I start my keywords. And so like literally at this point in my career, I've probably said, said it hundreds of thousands of times to myself, but, um, I say, see it. And, and I take three steps, one for each word, take a breath through it. I take my steps to the side and then I take another breath and I say, see it and through it, see it, walk through it. And then I kick the ball. And so basically I've now where I've timed it up, I've timed up the breaths. And so my mind just kind of goes to autopilot where at practice, it's the same kick as a game kick because I say the same thing at practice that I do in a game and where my mind gets so focused more on what I'm trying to accomplish in the process that I'm no, no longer worried about the result because I'm so focused in the process, which, you know, hopefully will make the result take care of itself. So then, you know, whether the result's a game winning kick or whether the result is a meaningless field goal in the first quarter, not that there are, there is such a thing, but um, you know, you don't have to worry about the outside environment. You're just only focused on the process. And so, yeah, to answer the question, the practice kicks are then exactly the same as a game kick because in a practice kick, same way, I'm completely focused on the process, on my keywords, 
on what I'm trying to accomplish. And, you know, you got to keep it small enough where it's like, I'm not thinking about 50 different swing thoughts. Like, you know, if, if you golf or something, you know, people are always trying to, you know, get better at their golf swing. But when you think about a million different things, it's impossible to do well because your mind's occupied to, with too much. But if you think about one or two things and one or two things that you can hopefully control physically, and, you know, then you can kind of control that environment, that process, and hopefully the results are controlled as well. Yeah, no, what, like that's, that's kind of like exactly the answer I would hope to hear as, uh, you know, a, whatever you want to call me, weekend warrior athlete myself, or I think um, for anyone else that wants to pursue mastery in any sort of like physical enterprise that like as someone who performs at basically the highest level you can in your given domain, that it comes down to just focusing on kind of like the process of the movement and the things that are perfectly within your control and that there's not some like magical resilience or immunity to pressure or whatever. It yeah. like, instead you kind of like take that out of the equation and instead you're focusing on just the repetitive movement, the repetitive aspects that you know, you've done the same in practice. You've done it a thousand times. You do it the same in the game and the kick is just like any other kick and you're focusing on executing what you can and kind of like the result comes out of that, but you're not thinking about the result itself as you're undergoing yeah. the yeah. process. That's really cool. I mean, cool. cause yeah, I, I think like, and I do think like personality and, you know, like I said, each, each person maybe has their own secret formula, but you know, I, th I think everybody can figure out what works for you. And, you know, I, I know I need to keep my mind really focused. My little brother, he's very different than me. He's, you know, a social butterfly. He, you know, he's just all over the place sometimes. And what he really needs to do is just kind of be relaxed when he's out there. He doesn't need to be overly focused. If he's overly focused, you know, that's just not himself. Um, you know, there's kickers around the league that are just extremely confident. There's, you know, there's tons of different personalities where you got to know like what works for you and, you know, try and utilize that uh, to get the best results you can. Um, and so I know for me, like I, I have to really work on the confidence the best way to do that is by preparation and, you know, practice and then carrying that over to game day where it's like, okay, I know I've put in the work. I know I've, you know, kind of given myself these, things to focus on so that I don't have to think about all the other things that, you know, you might want to worry about, but, you know, now I can hopefully just, you know, lock in on a couple things, rely on my preparation and then go play freely and, you know, have fun and hopefully succeed. As well. Yeah, definitely. No. And I think that is a good call out that there's different personality types that may need different things as they go to perform. But I do think that the, your story specifically in the way you approach it is probably one of the more relatable. Cause I'd guess that yeah. for every like really hyper confident athlete that knows that they can perform, there's probably, you know, nine out of 10 that are not that, that could yes. use the, the control, um, and, and the cues to focus on, especially as we drop out of, like in your case, you're at a professional level, but as we drop out to like more of maybe what the listeners, of the podcast or barbell apparel's customers or mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. These are people that are not professionals. They don't have necessarily this confidence that they know they can do it because that's like why yeah. people like me or or whatever the barbell apparel customers or other people listening to this podcast. That's why we even engage in athletics is to prove something to ourselves. So, like, kind of like fundamentally by nature, yeah. we almost like we're we're definitely not sure if we can. That's why we're yeah. doing it. Yeah. And so, being able to break it down to something like that, where it's like, okay. Um, like I, I had a podcast interview recently with a very highly accomplished ultra runner and he mm -hmm. echoed something similar that like, he was kind of like a natural talent when it came to ultra running. Um, he was doing things in his teenage years that like as ultra running has grown as a sport are more common, but in his teenage years, it was unheard of for teenagers to be doing the stuff he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so it quickly for him became about like, he was the best. He was going to prove he was the best. He was going to win. And unfortunately when things fell apart they fell apart hard because it's like in a, you know, hundred mile run, if you're off pace by mile 50, you know, you're not going to win. There's 50 yeah. miles left to go. It's not going to happen. And so because the goal was to win, um, things would just spiral out of control at that halfway point. And he'd have to run another 50 miles kind of like in this terrible state and have a horrible yeah. finish. But by reframing the goal 
to being more process oriented, like, hey, I'm just going to focus on executing what I've trained. Not only was he able to improve his performance, but he was able to kind of like overcome all of those terrible mental obstacles and turn it into something that was grueling into something that he really enjoyed. So I think that's really, uh, really cool. Yeah, Yeah, that's awesome. And something that like all of us, you know, mere mortals can apply to uh, the stuff yeah. we do. Yeah. Well, and I think, like you said, it's it's more relatable where like, yeah. you know, no matter what you're doing, whether it's just lifting or, you know, whether, whether you're a weekend warrior type, you know, kind of what you alluded to. Like, I don't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't just born with some magical formula and like knowing how to kick the ball. I go out there confidently and like, I don't even have to work on it. Just, it doesn't, it doesn't come easy. It's. Yeah. A lot of work, a lot of figuring out, hey, what works for me? And I think everybody can find that in themselves. Like, you know, like I said, everybody's got a different personality. Everybody's got different passions. And, you know, I, I think for me, like I'm a very detail oriented, focused person. I know those are good things about myself. But yeah, confidence comes. It's hard to be confident naturally for me. And so I have to really work on that. Um, and especially in this sport where, yeah, games on the line, you're in front of a hundred thousand people plus millions watching, like you don't want to go out there not confident in your abilities. And so, you know, just figuring out over these last few years on like, okay, what kind of preparation do I need? What kind of, you know, tools do I need to have? Uh, so that when I do go out for those pressure situations, um, you know, I have the best chance to succeed. And, you know, on top of it, I don't want to go out there dreading it. I want to go out there and enjoy it. Um, and so that, that's kind of cool that I've, I think I've come a long way to, you know, now I'm going into my sixth year in the NFL, um, you know, and I, I'm enjoying it more than more than I ever have. Um, and, you know, I, I love the, the competitive aspect of playing at the highest level and, you know, getting to continue to push myself. And, and that's part of why I love kicking because it is – sometimes it's an individual sport and, you know, being like kind of a perfectionist mindset where, you know, like you said, a lot of it is just almost like me out there by myself, you know? And so that, that's, that's really special where, you know, I get, I get to kind of set the bar for myself and, you know, it, some days are frustrating because I'll miss two kicks in practice and I'll be, you know, pissed off. But, you know, overall that's a good day, but like the goal is always to be perfect. Um, and so just, you know, continue to strive. There's always just like, you know, I keep alluding to golf because I think it's the similar, you know, it's a similar swing. It's a similar mindset. Um, and it's a similar individual sport where, you know, even if you shoot your best round ever, you can still sc- shoot lower the next day. And so there's always a bar you can t- continue to reach after. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that kind of one of the interesting things about your career and probably what's helped shape this perspective you have is that you had such a rapid trajectory from kind of like a, you know, a, a, I, I don't want to like say this the wrong way. Like, mm-hmm. it sounds like as a soccer player, you were pretty good, like not world yeah, class, yeah, but like absolutely. a pretty good soccer player. Uh-huh. So you were, you were a pretty good soccer player and then rapidly transitioned into like a world-class kicker. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't something that you had been doing since you were seven. It's something that like just kind of happened and people were like, Hey, you're really yeah. good. And, and you're yeah. like, Oh, really? I'm, I'm good. And then yeah. you kind of like took it to the highest level you could. Um, but in many ways you really did have something to prove, right? Because it's mm-hmm. not something you knew you could do. It's just something you kind of like found out yeah. that you were good at. And I'd imagine a lot of times those athletes you encounter with kind of like that unbridled confidence, at least many of them that I know, they've been doing this since they could walk. You know what I mean? So it's like they can't even remember a time when they couldn't do this thing that they're good at. So it's like if that's the background you come from, I'd imagine that, yeah, like it's such a core part of you. You can't remember Mm -hmm. a time when you weren't swimming or, um, you know, whatever else it was running. Yeah. Yeah. Then then it's a different dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, But with you, it's like you had to wrestle this this aspect of athleticism into submission, um, you know, kind of like from fresh starting in high school and Mm -hmm. then coming full circle to do it in the NFL, to figure out a system that works for you. And like self-admittedly, you said to come to a place where not only are you performing the best you have, but you're enjoying it more than ever. Yeah. I think that we could all learn a ton from that. And and thank you for sharing that. That's really cool. Yeah. No, I I think each day you got to prove it to yourself. And, you know, I just finished the workout before this, like, you know, like it's, it's not always fun, but you do, you do need to, you know, continue to strive to be, the best version of whatever you want to be. And, you know, I, I think it's, 
that's the fun. The journey is the fun part. Cause if, yeah. you know, if I'm only looking forward to, you know, the championship, the winning the Super Bowl, whatever it may be, like five years have gone by. I haven't won that yet. Obviously we haven't won that. And so like, then where's the joy in that? But you, you got to find the joy in the process. And, you know, I, I think that's what I've kind of been learning and, you know, hopefully for all the listeners, whatever, you know, process and journey they're on, they're f- learning to find the joy in that journey uh, of pushing themselves to be the best version of athlete, whatever business person, whatever it may be um, that they can be. And, you know, one, I think if you're enjoying it, you're going to be more passionate about it and, you know, push yourself even harder. So, um, you know, that that's something I've definitely learned along the way. Yeah. And I think that part of like, obviously we're talking primarily about things that are physical in nature, but even outside of the physical realm, I think that for human beings in general, there is like a true joy that can only be known in pursuing like the true mastery of something, whether it's a physical skill or maybe a more intelligence based skill or whatever, but feeling like you've truly mastered something or pushing towards that mastery is really like one of the most rewarding things yeah. I think that you can experience, especially if it's hard earned. Right. And usually mm-hmm. mastery in any form is quite hard earned, Yeah, but it's kind of like that. Um, I don't know. It's like a biological trick, right. To make yeah, us nothing, pursue I mean, the hard thing and be good at yeah, something that I may not have a nothing, payoff immediately. Yeah. Nothing, you know, nothing easy is, is always worth it. Like, is it, it's easy. It's not rewarding though, but like something you have to earn and really put hours and, you know, put your mind and your heart and your soul into it. You know, I think that's where, you know, it's more satisfactory. It's more fulfilling at the end or along the journey as you're battling it out uh, with yourself, with your competition, with whatever obstacles are in the way. And that's, you know, that's, that's part of the fun in the journey uh, is that, that, that hard part of it. Yeah. Well, um, we've been chatting quite a while. We'll just ask you a couple more things and let you get back to your busy schedule. Um, I know in our conversation before we started recording, you mentioned that you're a father of two, obviously as a professional athlete with um, not only the in-season demands of playing games, traveling practice, you have the uh, off-season demands of staying in shape and shoring up any weaknesses, doing all the other stuff you have to do, having mm-hmm. podcasts like this. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you juggle it all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, figuring out what your priorities are, Um, you know, and we, we've discussed this before, you know, obviously being a father, being a husband, you know, being, um, you know, for me, faith-based Christian, um, you know, those come before football. Um, I don't get me wrong. I'm obsessed with football. And, you know, I, I wake up every day thinking about it. uh, But, you know, that that's not going to fulfill me, you know, if I am missing out on those other things. And so, um, yeah, I've had to learn as I've gone, how do I go into football each day and, you know, turn into this ultra competitor, ultra focused, you know, ultra perfectionist where, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a, I'm not very relaxed. I'm not very fun to be around necessarily in a lot of those environments. You know, I'm just so wanting to do well and, you know, be the best version of myself on on the field uh, that, you know, I need to learn how to kind of turn that switch off when I come home and hang out with a two-year-old, you know, it's, you know, when I dress up as a princess with my two-year-old, you know, I, I can't have that ultra focused, ultra like perfectionist mindset. Um, I can't be, you know, that kind of David Goggins mentality of like, Oh, I got to grind, you know, like, it's just, you got to learn how to turn that off. And so that's something I'm continuing to learn, uh, you know, when I'm coming home from work, but, you know, obviously that's, that's the fulfilling thing for me is, you know, get a hang with my kids, get to hang out with my wife and, um, you know, enjoy all the, the fruits of, um, you know, the labor that I get to put in on work, but, you know, what is it all for if you're not going to enjoy, um, you know, coming home to your family and, um, spending time with them and hanging out with them. Yeah, no, what, what, what a great way to put it. And, um, I think there's two things that I could unpack there. One would be like for someone like you or for any man that's trying to perform at a high level in his career or in his hobbies, right? Mm-hmm. The contrast that a family and young children provides is like much needed, right? Like you yeah. need that opportunity to come home and not have to be mm-hmm. that kind of like competitive person yeah. Um, or the competitive machine. You can like turn off and like be goofy with your kid. Yeah, it's like exactly. a very good reprieve. And I would bet that if you looked at the science behind it, right? Like the, 
there's probably like a great physiological component that happens where you can 100%. like get rid of all that cortisol, the adrenaline and come down yeah. to a level where you're just having fun. Um, that's really enjoyable. And 100%. like, I don't know if I've ever mentioned to, uh, to the podcast people, but I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So I know this firsthand. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's like a really rewarding experience. Um, you also mentioned that your faith and your family come above football and like, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I'd echo that like with my, I'm 30, about to be 34. And so with my life, I've probably achieved things in terms of business and career and monetary achievements or whatever mm -hmm. that many people younger, my younger self, for sure. Like when I was 20 something, I would have done anything to have. And yeah. now that I have it and I have my family side by side, I would give all of it up in an instant for my family. That's way Absolutely. more fulfilling and way more Absolutely. important. And so, yeah, so to hear you say the same thing as an NFL player, like literally one of the hardest things and most unlikely things to happen to somebody, that your family is more important than that, um, shows a lot about your character, which is great. But also I think the thing that should be said and taken away for a lot of people is that like anyone can have that, right? Not everyone can mm -hmm. be in the NFL, but anyone, if they set their mind to it, can have yeah. an amazing family. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's just cool that like, even though you're doing things that are like beyond so many people's wildest dreams from a career standpoint, that you self-admittedly say that your family is the bigger priority and the more fulfilling yeah. and rewarding aspect of your life. So really 100%. encouraging to kind of like all of the normal people listening. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think that like as someone with faith, um, it helps orient you and, and set your priorities right. Not that you have to have faith to do that, but it does help create a hierarchy to where you realize that like, hey, this career, like an NFL career is a great example. Like luckily as a kicker, you have probably one of the longest opportunities for an NFL career mm -hmm. out of most mm -hmm. of the positions that play. Um, but for a lot of athletes and especially in the NFL, that career could be like shockingly short, right? You could be yeah. like 30 years old and done. And so yeah. it's like, if that's all your identity is and that's all that matters to you, it's a rough way mm -hmm. to, to live your life because it's that will come and go and yeah. you have nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I now average, really, I was going to say, I think the average in the NFL, like careers, is like two, two years, maybe under. Yeah. Um, and so, Wild. you know, if you're, if you got all your eggs in that basket, that's, that's a tough way to live your life. You know, I've seen a lot of guys that have achieved the highest level of athleticism, the highest level of, you know, like monetary success where, you know, in the worldview, they have everything you could possibly want, but you know, that's, they're completely unsatisfied. Daniel, it was uh, great chatting with you today. We'll let you get back to your life and your family. Um, thank you for the time.